of live. I'm Matthew Hill, flying solo today. Carol couldn't make it, um, but I'm excited to be here and answer some questions. And as always, hopefully get some information from, from y'all to share. As I say, knowledge is power. And, and the more you guys know, the more you, you're going to be able to get the benefits you deserve. So let's jump right in. Leonard, good to see you again. Well, I finally got my denial letter. 14 months, 14 months, I have my diagnosis for heart valve replacement and bypass and hypertension and anxiety, but they said I need a nexus so I could use my obesity secondary from loss of use of foot. Does that sound like a good strategy? Still need to file sleep apnea and depression and neuropathy and guard. Any advice still looking for increase on severe knee pain from arthritis and bone on bone, skin and skeleton scars? I am 0% rated. Hopefully, you get an increase. <clears throat> it's been getting worse for 40 years. Thank you for everything. All right, so let's go back to what was the first question. Um, all right. They say I need a nexus. Okay, from loss of use. So, yes, you are going to need a nexus. If you had loss of use of your feet, you are sedentary, which is, you know, kind of an obvious, um, to, you know, uh, something that would happen because of the loss of use, which would lead to the obesity, which then led to the problems you had, which were, go back, Nate, what were the, uh, for the heart, the hypertension, the anxiety. So I would definitely, um, I would, you need to look for that nexus. Essentially you're saying, but for the, the problem with the feet, the loss of use of feet, you would not be obese. You know, you, you would be active. You'd be able to get up and get around and live a more healthy lifestyle. And because of the loss of use of feet, you became obese. Because of the obesity, you had these problems with the heart valve, the hypertension, and the anxiety. Uh, so let's go. There's at least one or two more questions. Um, yeah, if you haven't filed that that knee, you need to file that as well. Um, just to, just to ho hopefully go ahead and get an increase on that. Uh, because I, you know, that that's, if you're at 0%, I think you need to definitely file there and go back one, Nate. The depression you already have going through the anxiety claim, basically the VA views them one and the same, that it's a mental health disorder. And you're saying it's either related directly to service, or I would also say in this case, that it's probably related to the loss of use of the feet, considering that that's changed drastically your life, changed who you are, what you can do. So th that is already there. You already have that. But if you feel like you need a claim for sleep apnea and neuropathy, you need to put those in now and get those going. Good luck on that. All right, Cerebral One, good to see you. Part one, VA awarded service connection for bilateral ankle at 10%, October 23, with an effective date of June 11. Last week, I went to the podiatrist and told, was told that my symptoms actually put my bilateral ankles at 20%, according to the federal regulations, I submit the new ankle examination opinion back to the RO for correcting the rating percentage with the same effective date of 2011. The rating decision assigned my percentage and effective date was dated October 23, six months ago. The change would represent considerable act, uh, retroactive payment. Yes, that is exactly what you do. You submit a supplemental claim to the regional office saying that, you know, here's the actual severity you have, and this should go back to, to 2011 because you're within a year of that BVA decision. <clears throat> Natural Builder, been waiting since July 23 for a decision from RO regarding a remand from the board. Both CMP exams done in July stated more likely than not injuries caused by service event. Submitted a priority processing in October, still waiting on the RO. Why the wait? Do they delay because my CMP exams are favorable? Been over five years since my initial claim. Um, you know, again, when, when when I think about the VA and I think about whether something's malicious or it's incompetent, a lot of times things look like they're doing stuff against you because you know they don't want you to win. But really, it's incompetence and backlog, and that's what's going on here. These BVA remands, where they're asking for CMP exams, are sitting forever. Even though in your case, when you've already gotten the CMP exams and it's sitting there waiting, unfortunately, I think you're in a hurry up and wait situation. There's not much that can be done here. I mean, you've already already put in the priority processing, and I think that's great. Uh, but th they don't give the attention I think they should on the remands. Um, they're they're busy processing new claims. So unfortunately. Um, you got to sit tight there. I'm sorry. I couldn't give you better news on that. 
Wadapin, buddy statement I submitted on a 214138 and he signed signature block nine. My info, uh, so security number is at the top, but my signature is on the form. Was that done correctly? Appreciate you guys. Yeah, if you're not the one signing, if, you, if you're not, if it's not your statement, it needs to be the buddy who signs it, not you. Um, they're, they're the ones swearing to the, uh, to the efficacy and, and the truthfulness of the statement. So you don't sign that, they do. Hobie Wan Kenobi, good to see you. I was wondering if there's a time frame on CMP exams. There is no time frame. If one was done less than 12 months ago, is it still valid? Yes. Is there a rule of law regulation addressing this? Thanks for all the help. There's no rule of law or regulation. It might be actually in the RO's uh, M21 manual, which is their processing manual. But if you had a CMP exam done and it has not been used in a rating decision, then that's still a valid CMP exam that they need to address the results of. Airborne Trooper, good to see you. Part one, did CMP exam for increase will have PTSD, TBI 70% to 100% in 12, 23 PTSD and the TBI. VES has not sent my VA, has not sent the VA my results. Called the ES, they said they're comparing my PTSD and TBI exams. What could they be comparing that would take this long? My original claim was for an increase in PTSD only since it's classified as PTSD with TBI. I had to do two CMP exams. This feels too long. So with PTSD and TBI, there is a part of PTSD that is a mental health component, and then you have PTSD. What the VA has to do is they have to say, okay, are there two different distinct symptoms going on here? If there are two different set of symptoms that are distinct and the, and the doctor can say, you know, yes, there is, no, there isn't, then you would be rated if the doctor can say, yes, there are two distinct symptomologies going on, this is PTSD, this is TBI, even though those are both mental health, you can get rated on both, okay? So you can get the 70% from PTSD, but if there's also problems, just the TBI causes from a mental health, like forgetfulness or you know extreme anger or something like that, then you can get a separate rating for that, okay? If the VA comes, if the doctor comes back and says, there's all the symptomatology, I can't tell which one's which, then they only rate you for the higher of, of uh, the scale. So if you meet a 70% for PTSD, only 50% for TBI, then you just get the T you just get the PTSD rating. Why are they taking so long? I don't know. These are more complicated um, CMP exams to do, and they do have to be, one has to be kind of um, put next to the other to make sure there's no pyramiding or you're not getting more benefits than you should. Also that you are getting your maximum benefits and that you might get rated for both of them. So. Uh, I don't know why it's taking this long. I, I agree with you. I think that's too long, but that's probably what's going on in the background. Thank you. <laughs> don't forget to like. <laughs> thank you. I always forget to say, don't forget to like and subscribe. So thank you for doing that, Edward Trooper. <laughs> Oscar, one of two. Hello, I'm a former reservist seeking advice on my VA claim for depression. I serve frequently frequent funeral honor duty, which I now realize may have triggered my diagnosis of depression seven years ago. I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder while serving as a reservist, less than a year after 60, 60 day active duty orders in the US where I attended numerous funerals. First time filing, seeking advice. So you're gonna need a nexus here. You're gonna need a doctor saying because of these funerals, the funeral service you had to do, it either started, exacerbated, or you know, manifest your depression. Okay, you're going to need a doctor that says that, but that's obviously a valid problem. I mean, uh, depressions are grim, somber. They make you think about the end of life. They, you know, people die in, in very tragic ways. And I could see how that could just kind of spring to life a depression. So you need a doctor to basically look at that and say, I've, you know, reviewed his record. I've talked to him. There's no prior problem here. Um, it's as likely as not that the depression was caused by his duty in service to do these to do these funerals. Ned, one of two. Have you heard of any delays in retro payment? I received 100% PNT in November. Thanks again. I'm also retired. I'm now receiving 100% my retirement pay and disability. So I have to assume the concurrent determination has been made. I just don't know how long to wait before calling. So yes, this is a um, DFAS. It's the name of the whatever the acronym for the the financial department and the, the Department of Defense that that looks at offsets. And so what they do is when a veteran has 
concurrent retirement and VA benefits, they will grant, and, and is at 100%, then they will grant the current 100%. So you get that on an ongoing monthly basis. However, they will not release the retro payment until any um, fixes need to be made as far as offsetting prior benefits. Um, you know, they would take back money from, from prior benefits for VA if they th determine that there's an offset. This takes forever. This is extremely frustrating. We have this with our clients all the time. It can take two months. It can take six months. I have never found a mechanism to, to make them act in a reasonable manner. Meaning like I haven't found a phone number, uh, somebody to, you know, email or somebody to reach out to that will, will trigger a, Hey, it's been too long. I mean, honestly, the folks I've talked to the VA, they don't even have a way to contact them. So this is super frustrating. You've won your case, you're getting the benefits you deserve, and they're just holding on to this. You know, if you're hundred percent now and you're hundred percent, then there should be no offset, but I, this is what we see all the time is they hold the money and then one day it just magically appears. So, uh, yeah, I hear your frustration. It's something we deal with all the time. You just got to sit tight here. Bob S number one filed sleep disturbance. Parasomnia, well-documented service, IME service connected. Other claims for major depressive disorder and general anxiety disorder as acquired psychiatric disorder, secondary to tinnitus or sleep disturbance, parasomnia. My tinnitus is service connected. CMP examiner denied that the mental health conditions was related to tinnitus. However, in their marks section, she noted that my major depressive disorder and general anxiety disorder was at least as likely as not service related to my service. Is this a duty to assist her? Yes, this is a duty to assist her. Um, that might be an inadequate opinion if she just said that and didn't say why, meaning she had to show what in service would have caused that. So that opinion probably needs to be, uh, how would you say that? It needs to be more detailed. Um, and so that should be sent back for more. If they deny you on that, you want a higher level review. And it sounds like Bob, you're in the right place already and that you know what you need to do. You say, Hey, this is, this was a, um, duty to assist failure to duty to assist because it's an inadequate exam. Oh, I have CMP DBQ. Should I file HLR now or wait for the C file I already ordered? I mean, I guess what I don't, I'm assuming you mean by those DBQs, those are the ones that were used to make the decision. If you already have those, I would file the higher level review now because you have, I think, the pertinent information to make the determination on your case. When you go there, I would argue and say, okay, even though they didn't say it was secondary service connected, it should be service connected because of what they said in the remarks. In the alternative, it's an, it's an inadequate exam, but I would lead with, hey, you have all you need here to grant this. They say it's service connected. From what you said, that's probably an inadequate reasoning for that, but why not lead with it and see what you get? Randomly rusty. I put in a claim for shelter employment that got denied and then put in a supplemental claim that got denied. I went through you guys as my lawyers, not sure what the next step is, if there are any. Um, Rusty, I don't, I don't know who your lawyer is, but you, you just need to call the office and have a contact with them to, to review the decision and see what to do from there. AEH, one of two, I'm currently service connected to 80%, 70 PTSD, 30 asthma, 10 tinnitus, zero sinusitis and rhinitis. I was just diagnosed with sleep apnea. I'm looking to file it as secondary. What's the best way Best bet to connect it to avoid pyramiding. Also, my private doctor will not provide a nexus letter. Any suggestions on saying one elsewhere? Thank you for all you do. Let's go back to the first part of that. Gosh, the way I see it, you could claim it's secondary to PTSD, asthma, sinusitis, and rhinitis. Okay. So I would say it's secondary to all those. Um, and the VA needs to figure it out. Okay. The VA needs to say it's not secondary to any of those. Um, I don't have a doctor that I could recommend, unfortunately, for a sleep apnea case. Uh, we do do some of those, but um, they're hard, especially staying at secondary PTSD. Frankly, I think the VA is more accepting of the asthma, sinusitis, or nice route. Um, so, I, but I would put it in all, say it's secondary to one of these issues. Uh, you know, hopefully the VA is going to do a CMP exam no matter what. So go to that, see what they say. If they get it wrong, then I would look on the internet for you know, uh, nexus letter for sleep apnea. Ann Holder, uh, would you review briefly what pyramiding is? Thank you for all you do. Sure, Ann. So pyramiding essentially is 
if you have two disabilities that have the same symptoms, you cannot get compensated for both of those. Okay, so um, common ones would be radiculopathy, which is pain in your lower extremities caused by lum lumbar spine disorder. Uh, usually you get tingling, you can get numbness, you can, it can feel like uh, uh, just nails, um, really spiky. Another disorder you can have is called neuropathy, which is secondary to uh, diabetes. If you have both of those, they end up causing the same problems, the same pains on the extremities. So the VA is not going to give you a rating for each of those because they say the symptomatology is basically the same. So we're going to rate you on that. Another very common one is mental health disorders. There is only one scale for mental health disorders. So I have vets all the time who have depression, anxiety, um, you know, some kind of psychosis like a schizophrenia, uh, a PTSD. They'll have three or four different diagnoses, but the VA is only going to rate them and actually pay them for the highest one. So if you have sleep disturbances because of PTSD, um, you're not able to socialize with more than your regular friends because of the schizophrenia, um, but then you are a shut away and you never you know, go out, you have suicidal ideations because of the anxiety. Well, that would be a 70%. The first one would be PTSD and sleep disturbance would be 30. And then the, you know, not wanting to meet new friends would be at 50. So they're only going to pay you the 70% because otherwise it would be pyramiding giving you all those because the symptomatology is rated on the same scale. That's a great question. And, and I appreciate you asking that. Jess, the VA reduced my award from 80 to 70 because it says it was illegal to have two breathing conditions, sleep apnea 03 and asthma in 18. So what you need to do here is go to 38 CFR. Um, it's in the 400s. Nate, will you put up the, uh, the diagnostic codes? And you need to look and see the ratings for sleep apnea and asthma. Sleep apnea, if you're at 50%, it's basically rated for that just because you're on CPAP. Asthma, you need to see on there what your rating would be and what those symptoms are and see if you can establish that those symptoms are, are independent of what the sleep apnea symptoms are. OK, so if your symptoms are, you know, restricted airway, um, you, your, your breathing is, is not getting the right amount of oxygen or something like that. And you can show that the rating for the CPAP for the for the sleep apnea does not contemplate those issues. It's not specifically described those issues. And you say, look, these are two different rating criteria for two different rating schedules. And I believe I should be rated for each. Uh, Michael, one of two during the CMP exam was decided my TBI got better. The VA is planning on reducing my rating from 40 to 10. My claim that was submitted was about adding migraines to my TBI. If the claim was about adding migraines, but that was never discussed in the decision, do I need to have a CMP questionnaire before I put in for a higher level review? Interesting. Um, I would ask for a higher level review straight out and just say my claim was for migraines, not for a reduction of my TBI. This was never addressed. Therefore, the exam was inadequate. The exam was supposed to cover migraines secondary to TBI. It never did so. Therefore, there's nothing, you know, this, this was improperly rated. You can't reduce something when they didn't even address the central issue. So that's what I would say. It says an inadequate rating. Excuse me, inadequate, uh, inadequate CP exam, excuse me. LG, good to see you. Hello, if granted 30% for granulomitis, pulmonary lung condition, can COPD still be claimed or is that pyramiding? I think that's going to be pyramiding, but again, look at the federal reg. On both of those, the diagnostic code that uh, Nate put up, just look at the both of the two ones, see if you can parse out different symptomatology from each that would, would require a rating. Um, unfortunately, I, uh, those are pretty darn close. So I, but I don't know. I mean, prove me wrong. Hopefully prove the VA wrong on that. Miss Ambiguity, Nemer, does bronchus include crinus, chronic sinusitis, strep throat, <clears throat> gustatory rhinitis, emphysema and other related respiratory like conditions. No diagnosis for bronchial cancer, but symptoms fit cancer. <sighs> um, I think the presumptive here is only going to be for the cancer. The other issues, you're going to have to make a direct service connection claim, meaning you're going to need to get a nexus to show that the, the Agent Orange could have caused those issues as well. 
Cincy Rebel, just want to say thank you for the information provided me. I have been out since 06, recently got rated 50%, just submitted a higher level review based on information you all provided. Trying to get back pay to back to my discharge in 06. Thanks again for this awesome information. That is great to see. Uh, Cincy, get, get back to us when you have that, that uh, higher level review and let us know how it goes, but I'm, I'm glad you're getting what you deserve. LG again, brother Matt, I'm trying to help my dad file for TDIU and he has the necessary ratings to do so. Any other recommendations to help improve his case? So you got to fill out the 80, the 218940. That's basically saying, you know, a case for TDIU. Um, get his employment record, show that he's not currently working. If you can get a statement from his former employer, you know, showing that there was a decline in the employment or what he was like when he stopped working, showing that you know he couldn't keep the job up, that would be something that'd be very helpful. Otherwise, a medical opinion speaking to the fact that you know this is what he used to do, this is his current limitations, that's why he can't work. Um, I said medical opinion, you can get a medical opinion, but I prefer a voc, re, a voc uh, rehabilitation expert, a VE. Uh, they can do a much better job, I think, than a doc because they can take the symptoms and the limitations he has because of his service-connected disability graph them on top of what he used to do, what his skill set is, and show what, what is impeding him from being able to keep a job like he had. And remember, age is not a factor, okay? Good luck there. H. Samal, CMP told not to attend by VA. They called this a medical exam and denied my claim. Unusual. I, yeah, if the VA ordered a CMP exam and then said, don't attend. I've never heard of that. That's pretty bizarre. Um, I would file a higher level review and say, I got contradictory advice from the VA on this um, and ask for a new exam. I think uh, that's just really weird. Kevin finally got approved for TDIU. Thanks for your advice. Hey, that's great, Kevin. Good, good for you. Thank you for your service. Get on out of here and stop being bothered by VA stuff. Live your life. I'm glad to hear that. Mark Hada, one of four. Aloha, malaha, mahalo to all CMP does for us. I had a dry eye exam November 23 and was told when I checked I was denied but never got an official denial letter. VA scheduled another dry eye exam, although I never requested one or appealed. Is that normal? How do I decline the second exam if I want to challenge the first? I called VA. And they noted it was for me, but VSA still, VES, excuse me, still scheduling. I believe I can overturn denial through higher level review or supplemental since I don't see the rater overturning the examiner. The examiner linked eye condition I didn't claim, which causes dry eyes, but deny dry eyes. Any thoughts? Thank you. All right, let's get back to the first one on this. Was told, aren't you? Okay, so you're within the year of getting the denial, so we don't need to worry about you getting it or not. Go online, um, myebenefits.com or healthyvet.com, I think it is, or .gov. Pull the letter down and then uh, ask for a higher level review there and say, look, this isn't right. Um, if, but if you got scheduled for another dry eye exam and the first one was negative, I don't see the I don't see why you wouldn't want to attend it because there's a possibility of getting a positive exam there. I would consider doing that. Um, but if you feel like you can overturn it just on the evidence that's in the file, then yeah, ask for a higher level review right now, skip the exam. But I, I would tend to want to go to the exam if I get another shot there. That's my thoughts. John Johnson, how to prepare for a HLR plus planus. Okay. First thing you want to do, is look at your rating decision. On these, on these rating decisions, they have a list of what's called favorable findings, okay? So they'll tell you what parts of the claim you did meet. I bet you with Plus Planus, you actually have a diet. So again, for service connection, direct service connection, you gotta have a current diagnosis, something happened in service, and then a connection, a nexus between them, okay? You wanna see what of those are in the favorable findings. Do, th do they admit you have uh, a problem, a current diagnosis problem? Do they admit that something happened in service? And do they admit on the nexus? So you want to look at those and figure out which one do you not have. Then go in your record and figure out what evidence in there that proves that point. So let's say they said that there's no nexus, there's no connection between what happened in service and what's going on now. 
you want to see, well, was there a positive medical opinion they didn't look at? Was the medical opinion that they relied on inadequate? Okay. So you would first look at the decision, see what you have, then look at the medical determination, CMP determination they used, see if that was adequate or not. Make sure that there's no other medical evidence they should have considered. And then you go in, you know, I, I would ask for a hearing, which is basically this informal conference you have with the decision review officer. And then you say, you point out what was positive, what was overlooked, or if the decision was based on a CMP exam that was inadequate, you point that out to them and say, this needs to be sent back for a more thorough exam. Um, but the, the rating decision will give you the roadmap as far as what is missing or what is, what is already there. And then what is missing, look at the CMP exam from there. Excuse me, if it's about a rating, then you're also going to want to look at the diagnostic codes to figure out what you think the rating should be based on <clears throat> the level of severity and the symptomatology that you have. Best of luck to you on that. Let us know how that goes. Another step. Good to see you. I filed two claims, skin and sleep apnea in January. February, VA sent a letter saying sleep apnea should be supplemental. My mistake. I agree. I have since sent the request form. The documents uploaded in Jan for both claims can all be seen in my skin claim when I look online. There are no documents for sleep apnea. Will the VA find my forms, uh, DBQ, buddy statement, et cetera, and new evidence for my sleep apnea? Do I need to write a letter or resend the forms via quick submit? I don't want to hold up the process. Yeah, that, another step. That's what's so frustrating is, you know, you're relying on them to put the information you sent into the, the file. Sometimes it sits there and they don't put it into, into the file until they actually decide to act on it. Do you send it again? Well, you know, on one hand, that assures you the fact that it got sent in. But on the other hand, you're right. That could delay your case. I would give it a couple of weeks and look and see if it's uploaded. Um, just look, see, you know, you'll be able to see them working on your other case. And if you don't see it get uploaded in a couple of weeks, then I would send it again after that. Kids EDU, good to see you. If a veteran has back, bilateral feet, ankle ratings, and rating for one knee, but severe problems with the other knee with no in-service documentation for that knee, how does he get that knee rated? So that would be a claim of secondary service connection. If you have that many orthopedic issues going on, your other knee is going to be forced to carry the brunt of the weight, any torque, any just kind of sudden movements, making sure you are stable. Eventually that knee is going to wear down and maybe even get out. So what you're, you're claiming there is that due to these service connected disabilities, this knee is, is disabled. And so that's a secondary service connection, and that's how you would claim that. Okay, how does the bilateral rule to get a rating for the other knee? In my case, I have back, bilateral feet, ankles, one knee rating, which are combat related. I eventually found service documents that got my other knee service connected, but now I wish I could use the bilateral rule to get secondary rating for that knee so that it could be combat related as secondary ratings. Secondary ratings automatically are. How can I get the VA to re-rate first knee as secondary rating to my back so that it can be combat related for special monthly compensation? You know, I don't know other than you just uh, put in that request saying I'm requesting um, CRSC uh, for this knee and to do so it needs, I need, I want to show that it's secondary to these orthopedic issues. That That's what I would do. I don't know the VA is going to know what to do with that. I'd, I'd imagine you're at least going to have to go to a higher level review for them to understand the nuances of what you're asking. But that's what I'd look for. As far as the second knee being factored in the bilateral factor, that, that doesn't have to be combat related. That will be factored in once you get both knees. Well, actually, since you already have issues on one extremity, it doesn't matter what other part of the other extremity is uh, rated. You get, you get all of those to combine for the bilateral factor. Channel of love, hope, and faith. Service connected for tension headaches. Filed supplemental claim for increase. Denied as CMP said new symptoms are migraines. And I only have service connected tension, oh, tension headaches. Sound right? What now? I mean, uh, getting, a, getting a medical opinion from your doctor to talk about symptomatology and how it's related to ten tension headaches, that would be my first, what I would want. Um, and that would be a supplemental claim if you got that. Otherwise, you go higher level review and say, um, you know, look at the CMP exam to see how adequate it was to see if it literally said this issue is due to migraines, this issue is due to tension, 
headaches in, in, in UIC, why they said that and you have a reasoning as to both of those. If they don't have reasoning, then when you go to your high level review, you're claiming that it was an inadequate exam. Good luck there. Anthony Rivers, if I file for mental health, PTSD, and migraines, submit DBQs and Nexus for my provider, VA in turn scheduled me for a TDI exam, which I didn't request, file for. Am I obligated, not obligated to go? If you do not have a TBI diagnosis and no one has ever talked to you about having a TBI, you, know, you, you never had some concussive um, problem, I would not go because you have not filed for TBI. But if you have any notation of a TBI in your history, then I would go, okay? If you don't go, they're gonna deny you for TBI. If you don't have a TBI, you never had a TBI, you never asked for TBI, who cares? You know, you want these other issues to be decided. Um, but if there is any note of a TBI history, then I would go to that. Migraines would be uh, discussed and frankly rated as a part of the TBI there. Marvin. Hello, a month ago I was denied my GERD claim secondary to PFAS. I admit that I was, it was a mistake, but favorable findings and decision letter confirmed that GERD diagnosis based on STRs while active duty. Okay. I have since been diagnosed with anxiety and sleep apnea by my private doctor, claims pending for those. I suspect that I, I had those while in active duty in the 90s. My question now, how do I proceed with GERD claims since I have a year to appeal? Supplemental? No, 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 no supplemental. You go straight higher level review and you say, I should be granted this because it was in my, my uh, service treatment records and the doc said, I still have it now. Therefore, you know, since I had it in service, I have it now. It is related. It is the one and the same. And you ask at the higher level review for it to be, we don't want an adequate exam here. We want it overturned and you granted those benefits. Secondary argument again is inadequate exam because they didn't flesh that out and say that it was directly service connected. But I would be arguing saying, look, it says this in the exam. There's no need to develop this anymore. It says I had it in service, noted that my STR said this. It says I have it now. Boom, that's service connected. That's what I would go for. Another step, contacted my BSO to get my code sheet. He informed me that all my disabilities are static and there are no reevaluations. He went on to suggest I put emphasis on my mental health as it merits an increase. Is it common for a BSO to do? Is it likely that this is a wink and a nod that I should follow up? How do I get my magical, mystical code sheet? I, I mean, I would ask again, be like, hey, thanks for the advice, but give me the darn code sheet uh, is what I would say. Um, again, I think you can go into my e-benefits and guys, if you can put in the uh, comments here, anybody who's done this, I think you can do it that way and pull the code sheet from there. Um, you know, if, the, if you're, if your mental health claim is worse, I would definitely put that in. Uh, but I, I, you know, they should give you the code sheet and, and hopefully by asking again, they're going to do what they should there. Lonnie, I'm a client. My BBA hearing appeal has been over two years now. Is it true my attorney can withdraw the hearing and write a statement to let the judge make a decision? Will I lose my place in line? You can withdraw the request for hearing. What we found is they actually won't look at that until your hearing date comes up. It's, yeah, it's extremely frustrating. Um, you can't move into a different line, the evidence line or direct appeal line without losing your effective date, without losing your place once you've gone over a year. Uh, so unfortunately, this is, this is the place where you're stuck. We've had discussions with the BVA chairman about this and said this is completely incredibly unfair. They're complaining about these backlogs of hearings. We want to not have a hearing. We have all the evidence, but uh, for some reason, the way they're set up, they only look at this once a hearing, once that case is eligible for hearing. Uh, this, this is a major flaw in the system that we're hoping will be overturned by Congress uh, in, in the coming months. Happiness, good to see you. For 100% PTSD with disassociation, does it matter if it's depersonalization or also TBI with major neurocognitive disorder. Would that, should that be rated together or separate? Okay, so this is something I spoke to earlier. If you have PTSD with this association and the doctor can say, here are the symptoms of this, and then you have major neurocognitive disorder with, with the TBI and, and they can say, and the symptoms for this are distinct and they are one, two, three. If a doctor says, here are the symptoms for this, and it's clear the symptoms for, for the other one are over here and they're not crossed over, you get rated for both, 
Okay. If the doctor says, I cannot tell what symptomatology is caused by which disorder, they're, they're overlapping, then you only get rated for the higher of the two. So you get the 100% for PTSD, but you would not get the 70 or 100% for the, the TBI. <clears throat> Michael, I received 10% rating for constructive bronchiolitis today, but claim was filed in May 23. The effective date is now showing August 22. Which, which one will they pay me back to? If the effective date is August 22, they'll pay you back to that. If that's under the PACT Act, what they've been doing is taking it back to the date of the PACT Act. Broad TX1, one of two, claim for hypertension vascular disorder and 17 secondary uh, issues, including ESRD5 and TDIU. Decision letter one that denied all claims concedes Terra and states diagnosed with disability by VA cardio, gram, higher, uh, excuse me, hypertension, all secondary deferred till CMP. Post CMP, all, all claims denied appear I used uh hypertension vascular disease primary in lieu of hypertension how to fix hmm. okay i would go to a higher level review and say you know your job is not to say what the secondary disorder is caused by as far as if you have a primary disorder already if you have several primary disorders and you can say hey, i believe this is secondary related to my service connected conditions if you get wrong which one it is, they can't hold that against you. So I would go to a higher level review and say, look, this was rated on my heart disease, hypertensive heart disease, but I think it should have been discussed. The CMP exam should have discussed my hypertension and if that could have caused all these secondary disabilities. And you say it was never discussed in there in my CMP exam. I want you to read the CMP exam, obviously. Um, and if it doesn't discuss it in there and you say this was an inadequate exam and this is a failure to duty to assist, and he's sent back to discuss not only whether these things are related to secondarily to the hypertensive heart disease, but to the hypertension itself. LG, if I'm PNT but I'm nosy and would like to see my C file, would that open my claims? No. You're not asking for a claim. You're asking for a copy of your C file. And that should not open up anything. That, that's not the start of a claim. Michelle, sinusitis and is zero. Sick numerous times in service. Now I have bronchiolitis. How do you claim that as secondary? Just say I have this oh, back disability 20, lower back 10, ridiculopathy left and right leg. Would it cause concern or alert VA if I tend horseback riding therapy for PTSD? Maybe they could say in future if I wanted an increase that was aggravated by horseback riding and denied. Um, all right, let's go back here. There's a lot going on. First one, I would say that I would claim this dis disability and say it's secondary to your sinusitis and rhinitis. Next. So here's what's fascinating to me about this. If you have service-connected PTSD and you have these service-connected orth orthopedic problems, the VA is the one sending you to this horseback riding, okay? So if something happens in the horseback riding that makes your back worse, the VA owns that. They sent you there. It was part of their care. And if you get hurt because of that, then the increase in the back disability is on them and you get that, okay? They can't take that away from you because they're sending you to that therapy for your PTSD. Even if it's not service-connected and the VA is the one giving you that therapy, they still own that and you still would be able to get a service. You still be able to get an increase in the back or the, the ridiculopathy gets worse. Bruce receiving higher level ANA, but only being paid for SMCS. Wouldn't I be getting, shouldn't I be getting R1 or R2 because of higher levels of ANA? Hmm. You know, I don't have enough information here, Bruce to get, to get higher level ANA. I think you have to have other disabilities contributing to that is you have to have a two ANAs for different disabilities, or you have to have, um, uh, gosh, I don't know, Bruce, I, I, I need to see your whole, your whole sheet to be able to, your code sheet to be able to figure that out. Um, if you need higher level ANA, I, I still think you have to have more than just ANA for one issue, but I, uh, I can't, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to lead you straight here. I be king. 
It's been over 90 days since I asked for a higher level review. Should I be making phone calls? You know, they were saying 90 days early on. I'm seeing four to six months now. So that's what I'm seeing as far as delays. They say it's happening faster in their own statistics. I don't see that happening on my end. David Fox, my claim is ready to be adjudicated. DBQs were submitted in December. Any suggestions on how to communicate this to the rater that all evidence has been submitted? So it's been two months, over two months now since all that's been submitted. I would wait, um, give it another month. You know, I, I don't want to tell you other than that they're, they're backed up. Um, if you push them, sometimes it backs it up even more. It's kind of, it's a pain like that, but I, I would wait on that. Twisted L, good to see you. Question about sleep apnea. I heard if you have a CPAP, you get 50%. That is true. If you don't, it can be 10 to 30. The words used in the rating criteria such as mean, for example, but not limited to. Am I correct? Yes, you are. You're, you're good at your legal analysis there. That is very true. Is this correct? That could breathing assistance device be a mouth guard that was Rx by the VA? If this is the case, then wouldn't more vets be eligible for 50% rating, not just those with CPAP? You know, I would need to read that. Uh, I haven't read that diagnostic code in quite some time, but that, I love it. I'm just going to say I love it. Uh, that, that's great creative thinking. This way, veterans don't have to waste time fighting VHA to get a CPAP. My doctor won't prescribe it because she wants to exhaust all of their options first. That's pretty typical. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but, I, you know, part of what I try to do is be creative in our, in our legal reasoning and, and the way we fight. And, you know, if, if you read the regulation to, to be inclusive of the mouth guard, I would, I would totally go for that. Um, you know, that's what I say here. Again, knowledge is power and being able to manipulate their own words against them is, is a huge weapon you have. So please let us know how that works. I think that's absolutely fascinating. Jim, recently received 10% rating for degenerative arthritis of the right knee. Already have 10% for left knee uh, for degenerative joint disease and 30% for left knee for a lateral meniscus tear with severe instability. Should I be receiving compensation bilateral since both it's both knees? Yes. So what they do is they combine the 30, the 10, and the 10, and then they give you an additional 10% of whatever that combines to. So that should already be happening. And, and again, looking on your, your code sheet, you would see the actual um, math there on what they did and what they gave you. <clears throat> Wit, is material improvement determined with progress notes from VA appointments? The VA appointments definitely are evidence of that. If it shows that you're getting better and better, then that, that is strong evidence. If it shows that you're the same or you're worse, again, that's strong evidence for your case. Roman Raz, one of four, helped my father submit a claim with several conditions with original intent to file January 22. He was denied May 23 due to not being service connected. VSO su submitted supplemental June 23. After denied based on PACT Act, he was again denied August 23, no nexus of service. It was not PACT Act condition. Even though my father had a statement from VA medical records connecting his conditions to service, he got an independent medical exam and submitted another claim in December 23. He won his claim. However, they awarded him for a lower disability at the intent to file date and then increased it in June 23 based on the DBQ written by the date. Should the higher percentage go back to the intent to file date? Yes. Should he submit higher level review? Yes, you need to say basically in the higher level review, my, my problem, his problem started whenever the intent to file was, not when he had the CMP exam. The CMP exam just validated, or the, or the medical opinion just validated what he was going through. So it should go all the way back when he first started. He needs to say the symptomatology that was noted, give, giving him the effective date of June 23, is the same symptomatology he was suffering from all the way back to the intent to file. UBN, part one, good afternoon. I had an appeal hearing for TDIU last month. It was heard by a judge with supporting evidence and sent back to the regional office to rule as if it was the wrong jurisdiction. I have a financial emergency and they're supposed to escalate this matter, but the regionals just got it last week. After years, how can I have them expite this, excuse me, expedite this as the evidence and ruling is in my favor? You got you to gotta call, um, you got to submit whatever evidence that would show your, your emergency, submit that, you know, ASAP and then start calling. Um, they have a homeless coordinator that you can reach out to, even if you're not homeless, just to show that this is, uh, you know, above and beyond. 
the re the ro the regional office is honestly not as good at expediting as the bva is they they they're not as responsive and it's really frustrating but you need to be on the horn calling them make sure you've submitted whatever documentation you have to show the expedite is necessary though Remy 86 good to see you i was recently denied gerd secondary to ptsd i didn't even put in a claim for that my claim was for gerd secondary in my service connection for uh, major depressive disorder, MTSS, headaches, and peripheral neuropathy. Medication side effects and weight gain and obesity. How should I approach presenting an appeal to this? Thanks a lot. I think you presented it right there. You say, look, um, that's great. You denied me being secondary to this. That's not what I claimed. Here's what I claimed. I have all these other service-connected disabilities that were not considered. Therefore, it needs to be remanded for an adequate exam to consider all these issues and whether it's secondary to those. Alex, one or two, what exactly is residual right cancer? A residual right cancer. Currently in remission and in at judge for BBA for legacy appeal. Never left doctor's care, though, because technically my cancer is incurable. I still get checkups annually at the moment. Not talking about residual issues post-treatment, but more about what, when is treatment actually defined to an end and when 100% cancer alone ends. Cancer ratings are black and white. They're 100% or they're zero. It's 100% if you have an active cancer diagnosis that you're treating with a system-wide um, treatment, radiation, chemotherapy. Those are the main two, okay? So if you've treated it that way, it's 100%. If the treatment stops and the doc says it's not active anymore, what they then do is turn to the residuals that that um, cancer cost. Okay. So I don't know what your cancer is. I don't know what our, uh, YRT cancer is, but, but, um, you know, prostate cancer, right? When you have prostate cancer, a lot of times what happens is, is you end up having incontinence. Um, you have frequent urination. All those are residuals that, that are rated separately from the active cancer. So once cancer goes to zero, then you're rated on the residuals. So you'd be looking to see any problems you have, since you were diagnosed with cancer that are still active and get those rated. Citus Knights, hello, reviewed my C file. I just received 2005 CMP exam, MD. In my opinion, patient's current bilateral ankles and leg conditions related to service connected plus planus, not his back. Service connection for bilateral plus planus and painful heels, all of which could easily cause faulty gait pattern and therefore bilateral ankle strain during ambulation. I claim bilateral leg and ankle condition secondary service connected, 40% lower back, 10 for planus plus planus, 10% for bunion, 10% for scar, total 6%. RO 2005 decision letter denied, stating VA exam noted bilateral ankle and leg condition is not related to lower back. Decision letter, not, no mention of conditions related to, to feet. IU was denied too. Can I put in a claim and ask the 2005 effective dates? Would I also be reconsidered for IU? Thank you for all your help. So I would put in a claim, and I, I never recommend this, but this to me looks like clear and unmistakable error. And I would put in a Q claim on this saying that the, the prior decision should be revised under clear and unmistakable error due to the fact that there was a positive medical opinion linking what you were claiming, the secondary problem, to all those other issues, okay? There's no refuting that. They, they did refute the lower back, great, but that's not the only service-connected problem you have. And so I, I think you have a strong case there for Q. I, if you are a frequent viewer of the show, you know that I never say that because it's so rare to find a Q claim. But if that's exactly what it said, and there's no evidence contradicting that in the record, I think you have a great case there going all the way back to five. Once you win that, that should open up the IU claim back to then as well. <clears throat> Phil B. I shared my symptoms with CMP examiner. She rated me lower than suggested by the VA guidelines. Should I ask for a higher review? Heck yes, you should. And you need to point out in those diagnostic codes what you should adequately be uh, rated on. Spanky Spangler was recently granted TDIU, PNT. Should I file anything else? I have several other PACDAC presumptive claims. 
is my current rating really secure? No, it's not really secure. It's permanent total, but it's not um, protected until you have, it, have had that rating for 20 years. If you have other claims, I don't know about this. Um, unless you have significant cancer claims or something like Parkinson's, um, something that's huge, uh, I would not go for any ratings that are going to get you 10, 20% here or there because you're not going to get rated higher for that and you're going to stay on their radar. King of the Staterlites. Does your firm handle apportionment claims in regard to petitioning to compel the opposing party to file for them and legally gain access to disability benefit monies for child support and alimony? Uh, we do not do that. Um, honestly, I don't even know if you have to go through the state court first and then to the VA or you can go directly to the VA on that. So that's not something we handle. Cody Queen, 100%. Permanent total, have a bunch of TBIs and even have a purple heart for TBI. I'm almost 90 days from applying uh, SMCT. Do I have a chance? Well, to get SMCT, you have to be rated for um, rated for TBI and you have to show that you need a higher level of aid and attendance just for the TBI uh, to where you, know, you have somebody caring for you day in, day out. They're uh, helping with your medication. They're help, helping with your daily, act, active daily um, uh, living situation, all, all your ADLs. Um, so if you have those, then you do have a chance. Raphael, YouTube thumb 12. I was recently awarded 50% from 30%. My original claim was filed in 11-16, denied 18 and appealed. I'm soon to get new judgment or back pay. If you were awarded an increase and you you have continuously filed appeals or claims since 16, then yes, you would. But if you had to reopen the claim, then it's only going to go back to the date that you reopened, most likely. Spanky Spangler, can an intent to file be restored if it was unknowingly used up by the VA for an inferred TAU claim? Uh, yeah. I mean, you can as long as you file a claim within that um, 365 days of that intent to file, any claim filed within that 365 days should be considered on the intent to file. Another step, still in wait mode for my dad, hurt anything regarding Camp Lejeune. What I've been hearing for Camp Lejeune for, uh, for the direct federal lawsuit outside the VA is that they've actually started doing discovery in the hearings at the federal court and that they plan on having the first trials for Camp Lejeune veterans by the end of this year. Those are the um, bellwear, bellwether cases, as they call them, to will determine, you know, is the government liable? If they're so, how much are each of these kind of cases worth? Because they're going to have different values for a Parkinson's case than a cancer case, than a, you know, a GERD case or something else. So they're going to be putting all those in, and hopefully by the end of the year, the government's going to come down and, and give reasonable settlements mounts. I think the what they're doing now with the um, rapid reward or the accelerated process through the Navy, where you actually just put in a claim, you don't file a federal lawsuit. They're paying people for time that they were in the service at Camp Lejeune, not for the severity of their disabilities. I'm very leery of that. You know, if somebody was had Parkinson's and was at Camp Lejeune for 30 days, they're paying them like $100,000 or something. That to me is a multi-million dollar case and they're just trying to buy people off. I would be concerned about that. I'd like to see what the trials come back and show what the real value of these cases are. But to answer your question, we're hoping by the end of this year, we'll start seeing some of those numbers. Last five miles. Thank you for y'all do at H&P. We're better off with you on our side. Keep doing what you do. Thank you. And I appreciate all that y'all do. And I, I got to tell you, this is the highlights of my week. Just getting to sit with you guys and talk about issues and make sure that you have the knowledge you need to win the claims and get the benefits you deserve. Priscilla, good to see you. Hi, currently 90% rated IU. I want to claim GERD and COPD with docs from service. Would it be a waste of time filing conditions since I'm IU? If you're 90% for one issue getting IU, and you can get these other issues up to 60%, then you file, and that would get you SMCS, which is another three to $400 a month. If you don't have that, don't file because you're not going to get any more benefits. All right, let's take uh, about three more questions here. Ricky, 
I requested an increase for my TMJ rating. It came back reduced. CMP examiner made me open my jaw beyond where it was painful, didn't take my questionnaire and didn't write down my statement. All issues on failure to provide an adequate medical exam right there. You, you hit it good, Rick. That's I want that in your statement on the higher level review. RE soft food pain, speaking, reduced open flare up, et cetera. They said my jaw opens about the same, but no soft food restrictions or other issues. My VA dentist wouldn't note in my records those issues. I mentioned before the CMP exam, soft food, et cetera. So there's nothing in my record. I went back to ask them, but they said it's a conflict of interest in putting such notes. That's horse crap. Um, what can I do? You need to file the higher level review, talk about what you told the person that it's not in the CMP exam it notes at all, um, that you had to go beyond where it was painful. They should have noted that as well. Um, and you need to say the exam was inadequate and you deserve another one. Branyan, why I keep getting denied my claim saying that there's no continuity in care and how can I prove, pro, prove that there is when I'm self-medicated treated? Do you need to write out a statement talking about when the issue first started, how you have medicated, done self-care ever since then, and how the symptoms have, have remained? Whatever you first had is what you have now. Jason, I know a vet that submitted three personal statements from friends, family, and one personal statement but did not have to submit any VA forms to, to submit, but were accepted. How rare is that? That is now PNT. It depends on the nature of the disability. If, uh, you know, if the disability is something to where they can talk about it, they understand it, it doesn't need professional medical knowledge, then, then they can write out those statements and accept it that way. And then if those statements are enough to give a clear rating, they can do it without a CMP exam. Pretty darn rare, pretty darn rare to see that though. All right, folks. Um, Thank you for watching. I hope you guys do have a wonderful rest of your week. Remember, knowledge is power. I love these questions you guys are asking. I love that you're coming with having done research before, um, thinking about what you're going to do for your higher level exams, thinking about how you're going to write statements. The more you know, the more benefits you're going to receive for what you've done. Thank you so much.